All right. Now that everything's started, let's pray, shall we? <laughs> Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, O oh Lord, that you have called us, Lord, in this place, in this moment, and have ordained for us to be here, each and every one. That God, you have a special word for each person in this place. And so, God, I thank you in advance for what you're going to do through this message. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right, so... If you weren't aware, I was able to go to Israel. I left uh, last or two Sundays ago and came back Tuesday. Seriously suffering from uh, still a little jet lag, as my mother can attest. By 8 o'clock at night, I'm falling asleep on the couch. So trying to just kind of regroup a little bit. But I wanted to talk about some of the things that I was able to see while I was there. All right, first. Right arrow's good. No? You can just click on them individually, I guess, if that works. That's not a thing. There's no image there. I don't know what happened there. There you go. No. Yes. Okay. Just do it. Do it. Leslie's coming back to fix. <laughs> See if you can fix it, because I don't know what happened to the... You know what? Um, hey, Leslie, do you ever use Keynote? Go, can you go back one? There's no image on the other one? How about Keynote? All right. Ah, that's a pretty one, too. All right, never mind. So I walked, I walked, I walked along the Sea of Galilee, both in Tiberias, where um, uh, Jesus had cooked breakfast uh, for the disciples after the resurrection, and also right on the shores of Capernaum next to the ruins of the old city, which is really Jesus' city. Um, the next one is there. I saw that's the temple in Capernaum. I know it looks like nothing there, but what's cool about that is that that is the temple from that city at the time when Jesus was there. So Jesus would have stood there and taught right there. All right. I walked the seashore right in front of that city. We had an amazing moment with God there. We walked in Magdala. That's the next one with the um, mosaic picture. Next, yep. See all the mosaics? What's cool about this is you'd think that all of this stuff would have been found already, but they literally just found Magdala. And that's where Mary Magdalene is from. Yes? Mary Magdalene means that she was from Magdala. And that area right there uh, with all of the mosaics is uh, the part in the, the temple where Jesus would have stood. Because we know that he was there. I walked in Bethlehem. I went to the, the hills on the outside of the city where the shepherds would have received the, um, the, the news that the, the Messiah was born. I walked in, where's, Na that's Nazareth. We were up on the precipice in Nazareth. We're told in the scriptures that Jesus opened the scroll and read from Isaiah 61, and they were so angry that they brought him up to the crest of a hill outside of the city to push him off and to kill him, and that he just walked through the crowds. That is the one hill that's outside of Nazareth. And so we were able to go to the top of that hill and understand what it meant for him to be a man of peace, right? Jesus is a man of peace. Instead of confronting the crowds, he just walked through them. I stood on the ruins of David's palace and David's royal city. I climbed, climbed, next one, I climbed the stairs of ascent. Right there. If it gives you any idea of the size of the temple that used to exist there, those are just the stairs into the lower part of the temple. And because they've been rebuilt over time, the only part that would have existed is in that little shadowy place in the top left-hand corner. That's the only place that still exists from when Jesus was living. And so we were on the stairs of ascent going into the temple. And the next one is what? And then I also went on my final morning there. I got up early after spending all night watching the Super Bowl. Okay? Y'all were up at normal times watching the Super Bowl. I got up at 1.15 in the morning, watched the Super Bowl until 5, took a 45-minute nap, and then took a, a, a taxi with two other people in my group to go here. And this is the location of Dome of the Rock, which is the top of the Temple Mount. And then we walk there and watch the sunset, the sunrise. 
where the temple used to be. Incredible. Next one. All right, this one's cool. In 1 Samuel 17, it says this. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. They were gathered at Succo, which be belongs to Judah, in a camp between Succo and Azekah. Now, you probably can't tell because we went up to this hill afterward. But do you see in that far distance that valley between the two hills? Yes, thank you for the point. Right there? That's the Valley of Elah. The hill on the far side is Succo. Azekah is the one behind it. So the Valley of Elah is right there in between. So the names are exactly the same as the biblical account. And what happened there? It says Saul and the Israelites gathered and camped in the Valley of Elah and formed ranks against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side and Israel on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. You know, with some of these things, they would say, you know, uh, like say if we were on the Sea of Galilee in Tiberias, right? Well, you know, here's the city. We're right on Tiberias. Here's the Sea of Galilee. You know, where Jesus called the disciples, well, it could have been here and could have been over there, really, you know. But So they generally would say, but you're in the zone, all right? You're in the zone. And we'd be like, yeah, we're in the zone. Well, in this particular instance, that's it. So we stood in the Valley of Elah, knowing that this is exactly where David defeated Goliath. It was an awesome moment. There were so many of us that went down and collected five smooth stones and, and to take home with, because we're like, oh my gosh, right here is where David came up in the name of the living God to defeat the Philistines, right? We were like, yeah, it was awesome. And there was a bunch of us that, um, our, our guide had a, a slingshot, and he had everybody grab a stone, and everybody was doing the, sl <laughs> the slingshot in the Valley of Elah. But it was an incredible moment, right? Every moment for me was filled with that, like, are you kidding me? Uh, every one of us would walk around, and we'd get off the bus, and they'd say, oh, this is where you are, and this is where you are. And we'd be walking around looking at one another going, what? What? I can't believe I'm walking in these places that I've read about my whole life. Pinch me. I can't tell you how many. Pinch me. I couldn't believe it was real. So to say that the experience built my faith is really an understatement, right? It's an understatement. But here's the thing, and this is why this message is so important for you, for me, for anyone, right? Not everybody is going to be able to see or feel or experience the Holy Land in their lifetime, even though I would highly recommend that if there's anything you can do to save for anything, as a Christ follower, as, as one that believes in the one true God, if you can make that happen for your life, make that happen for your life. I, I had no idea how much it would affect me. I always wanted to go in a very cognitive way. Wouldn't it be nice to go and see all these things? And how cool would that be? But it's so different when you're actually, your hands and your feet are in the soil where Jesus redeemed Peter, right? Do you love me? Do you love me? He asked him three times. You know what happened to me in that moment when we had a moment of reflection? I remember that God called me to shepherd his people. And you know how many times I heard him call me? Three times. So in that moment, on that sea, I was just struck with a, such a love of God, a God that redeemed. I just got on my face. Literally, I, I wish I had that picture. And I got on my knees and just wept and prayed and cried. And the coolest thing is that it looked like sand, but when I got down, on, there were all tiny little itty-bitty shells. It's the coolest thing. So I took one home. I feel like, I feel like you know, Israel's going to disappear because everybody that goes on a pilgrimage there is going to take little pieces home. <laughs> I have a piece of the Dead Sea. I have my five little stones. I have my shell. <laughs> Anyway, but not everybody is going to be able to go there. We need to believe without seeing. All right, so scripture gives us a story where there's another story about somebody else that really wanted to see and touch and feel and understand so that they would believe, right? And we know of this person who's called Doubting Thomas, a horrible misnomer, really. The poor guy gets no credit at all for this story. So this, the story we hear is in John chapter 20, and it, verses 24 to 29. 
And it says this, now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, huh, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I'm not going to believe. So a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them, and through, though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. See, that's your inheritance today. That's you, right? 2,000 years later, I, I, I don't know that anyone here, you know, Paul was able to have an encounter with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, but I don't know that anybody here has actually seen Jesus. And so we believe without seeing. We believe in faith, in something that we understand. Now, Hebrews describes faith this way. This is in chapter 11. He says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith, our ancestors received approval. Say approval. Why do they receive approval? By having faith. Faith. Not faith that can be assured by something that you understand. Like, we have faith that an orange is orange. Why? Because we have, well... Some, somebody defined the concept of color way back when. But you can see it, you can hold it, you can taste it, you can smell it. It doesn't take a lot of faith to believe that an orange is orange or that it tastes good or anything about it or that a cow gives milk or any other thing because we can see, we can touch, we can feel. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. I'm going to read it again from the Amplified Version. It says this, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical sense. For by this kind of faith, the men of old gained divine approval. Say approval. Approval. By having what again? Faith. 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 Right? It's approval. Why? Because we will please Lord when we operate in faith. Hebrews goes on to say in verse 6 of the same chapter, and without faith, get this, it is impossible to please him. Without faith, it's impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and he rewards those who would seek him. So we think sometimes that in order to please God, we need to do more. Has anybody ever been there where you feel like you have to do more in order to please God? That you need to go to church more often? That you need to give more to poor orphans and widows? That I need to give more? I need to do more? And oftentimes we are looking for some kind of an approval that God is saying, that's not what I want. Faith. Faith. Thomas operated in as much faith as the other disciples, right? He gets the bad rap. Doubting Thomas, oh, doubting Thomas. Well, you know, when Jesus appeared to the women in the garden, and they came back and they said, we've seen the Lord. He's, ah, he's alive, he's not dead, right? What do they do? Huh? They have to run and go make sure that their ladies are telling the truth, okay? So just as much as Thomas needed some kind of assurance, so did Peter, so did the rest of the disciples. They wanted to see for themselves that the tomb was empty, that the grave clothes were empty, that everything about it was true, what the ladies had said. It's human nature to want proof, to want to see, to want to touch, to want to feel something in order for us to believe. And that's the struggle that we have sometimes. We want to share our faith, but it makes us sound like crazy people sometimes. I believe in something that I've never seen. <laughs> you know, I believe in faith. And let me tell you why. Because it's experiential. Maybe you've had an experience of God, a, 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 an understanding of how God has healed something or touched your life or changed your life or, or made something. And we try to explain the unexplainable. 
Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to believe this crazy story is true. That Jesus was lived and died and resurrected on the third day. That we've been given the Holy Spirit. This story can be crazy without faith. Faith is what pleases God, though. So even though I went to Israel, man, I believed before I went. It just was an assurance of these things. And you might believe today without ever seeing the resurrected Christ. This is the essence of faith, and it pleases God. Do you know that, the, that when you step out in faith, when you, you operate in these things that have no fact behind them, although there's a whole lot of facts, I can tell you more about what the things I've seen. So, so what? So you have faith. So you're operating in faith. Maybe you're saying, today, oh yeah, I have all kinds of faith to believe these things. Well, why does all of that matter? Number one, I'm going to give you two reasons to have faith, okay? You ready? Say two. Everybody's with me, right? Number one, do something. Say it. Number two, stand for something. All right, let's do it again. Do something. Stand for something. All right, my favorite musical is Hamilton. What does he say? If you stand for nothing, Burr. If you stand for nothing, Burr, what do you fall for? I can even do it in rhythm. All right? You got to stand for something. Yes? Do something and stand for something. Now, James, we've already talked about James before, right? James is the brother of Jesus. Talk about a guy that was radically transformed by what had happened post-resurrection. He's a guy that didn't want anything to do with Jesus and then became some of the founders of the church. James, he writes this, What good is it, my brothers? And sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Right? Faith should lead you to do something. Right? We don't have faith for ourselves. Faith is not a selfish thing. When we come to faith in Christ, immediately we are on mission. Right? If we have professed Christ as Savior, we are given a great commission to go, make disciples, go, do, do something. Your salvation is not for you. It's for others. Give sacrificially, serve selflessly, love unconditionally, do something. Because the way you live your life is a witness to somebody else. Your faith without deeds is dead. Because just as now, I went to the Dead Sea, and I'll tell you what, that is dead, okay? That is so full of salt that it's almost unbearable. They say, they, everybody says, oh, did you go swim in the Dead Sea? I put my feet in the Dead Sea, and that was enough. Because there's so much salt that any kind of little, like if I have a scratch or anything like that, it immediately kills. It's crazy. That is dead. Nothing can live in that thing. But then you, you have to, it's like if you're a child. I had to put my finger in it and taste it. Oh, my word, it's awful. It is so salt. It's like 30, 40% salt. The regular sea is three. It's crazy. All right, the Dead Sea. Why is the Dead Sea dead? Well, we understand that the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River flows through both, okay? Sea of Galilee has an inlet and has an outlet because things are coming in and it's not coming out. The Dead Sea just stops. And so it makes it dead because it just continues to collect and doesn't let anything out. In the same way, if we receive faith, if we receive salvation and do nothing with it, we're as good as the Dead Sea. We have to constantly be receiving and pouring out. Receiving and pouring out. Do something with your faith. We need to allow God to work through us, not just in us. Right? Too often we're going, what can God do for me? Right? I'm struggling. I have financial needs. Me, 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 me. God, you need to do something for me. God, you need to work in my life. God, you need to do something for me. God, what are you going to do to answer my prayers? Me, 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 me. And we're not thinking everything out. We need to do something, be concerned with others, constantly flowing out and using our faith to make a difference. It's more than just a get-out-of-hell-free card. Do you know that? Come 
coming to faith in Christ is so much more than that. And sometimes that's, all, that's why we market it so poorly. As Christians, we're like, you know what? Your life, it's all about having an eternal relationship with God. And once you make that decision, oh boy, then, then you get to spend eternity with Christ and it becomes that's the be all and end all. Like we just um, pause until we go to glory because that's what it's all about. But that's not what it's all about. It's about what we do now to make a difference. Yes, true. We have the benefit and blessing to know that we have the assurance of spending eternity with God, but that's not it. It's not it. Make a difference. I stood at the Western Wall, and I'm not Jewish, all right? Our guide told us at the Western Wall, they believe that the presence of God is there because it was the closest wall to the temple when it was destroyed. It's not the wall of the temple. It's, it's like a retaining wall. It's enormous. It gives you an idea of how big the temple was. It's just the wall that was close to it when the temple came down. It's the only one that remained. And so that they believe that the, it was the closest wall to the Holy of Holies, right? If you know the... Um, the understanding is that this, this inner sanctum is where the presence of God was. And so when the temple was destroyed, the, the presence of God anointed the Western Wall. And so I, they split the women and the men up. So the women have their one side and the men have the other side. And I went and I approached the Western Wall. And I did it in a very kind of like matter-of-fact way because... I don't have that history. I'm not Jewish, right? But boy, I tell you what, when I put my hand on it and started to pray, I had to get on my knees. There's something really powerful to know that you are joining the prayers of the saints before you, right? Hebrews tells us we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And so in that moment, when my hand hit that wall, it was me and millions of other people whose prayers have been lifted to the high and most highly God. It's amazing. And because of the prayers of those before you, because of the saints, because of the martyrs, because of those that have gone before you, you're here in this place. And that's why your faith has to do something to make a difference so that when generations from now, should the Lord not return, they'll be looking back and saying, oh, man, Brother Neil, he made a difference. Sister Debbie made a difference. Right? Sister Leslie, that your life stands for something and makes a difference going forward. All right, number one, do something. Number two, faith allows us to stand for something. Is she still up there? One more picture there, Amber, and then you can come on down. Okay. Does anybody know the story of Masada? Good, I'm going to tell you a story. Sit back and enjoy a story of Masada. All right. Masada is um, an unbelievable <laughs> construct. Okay. You can't see it from here. You see it in your bulletins, right? You see the cover of the inside of your bulletin? The inside picture is an aerial view of Masada. And as you can see, it's a big, huge mountain with a flat top. And originally, uh, Herod had um, built himself almost like a summer house up there, a place where he knew because it was like it, it stood alone. It was safe. It was a great place. He built a palace there with three levels and beautiful kind of facilities. And he built it primarily to make sure that his family would have a safe place to be if everything kind of hit the fan. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So he built his complex there. And after his death, the Romans built a garrison there. And then when the revolt kind of happened, they abandoned everything and went back into where all the stuff was going down. And this was just before 70 AD, right? Remember, Jesus had prophesied that the temple would be destroyed. Now, he did speak of his own body, but the, the, the next thing would be the temple actually did come down. And, and, and now, having seen the size, it really is amazing what had happened. So after this revolt, 
of the Jews against the Romans in 66 AD, a group of Jewish people known as the Sicarii, led by Menahem, took over the Masada complex. And everything that I read about them calls them rebels. Now, I like to think, like when we think about uh, the Revolutionary War, do we think of the rebels as the good guys or the bad guys? Well, I'm thinking about the, 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 the people here. Britain are the good guys or the, the people here are the good guys? No, no, the American Revolution. Okay, so the good guys are the ones that were revolutionaries. They were fighting against tyranny. They were fighting against that. So in the same way, the Jews at that point were fighting against the tyranny of Rome. And so this group of people escaped to Masada. It had been abandoned by the Romans. It had been abandoned by Herod, and he's long since dead. As a matter of fact, he never really used it. He built this beautiful thing and then decided to build something a little bit closer to town. You know, like a little closer to where the action is. And so we abandoned it. The Romans abandoned it. And then the Jews went up there and inhabited it. There was about 900 of them. And I like to refer to them as refugees. They were refugees from what was going on in town and escaping and trying to live their lives in peace up on the top of Masada. But the Romans wouldn't leave them alone. So, uh... uh a legion of Roman soldiers, 8,000 Roman soldiers went up against 900 Jewish people on the top of Masada. Now, it wasn't easy to get to. There was one little zigzaggy path, and they were constantly throwing things down and killing the Romans that were trying to come up the path. So eventually, Rome built a wall around Masada to keep anybody from escaping, built two camps around there, the, the ruins of which you can see here, okay? So if I were to look up in the upper, see how there's that craggy thing on the right-hand side? There's kind of a square on the upper right-hand side. That's the ruins of the Roman camp. And the wall is this little line that's really close over here. So they built a wall all the way around it. There's another camp like that on the other side of Masada. And 8,000 Roman soldiers began the process of building a bridge and a tower so that they could attack Masada. Can you imagine the amount of money, finances, time, people? They employed slaves to come in, their own Jewish people, to come in and build this bridge and build a tower so they could take Masada. It took them three years. Meanwhile... The 900 people are trying to live their lives on the top of the hill. When it became clear <clears throat> that the Romans were going to eventually take over Masada, this is 73 AD now, on the instructions of Ben Yair, all but two women and five children who hid in the cistern and later told their stories took their own lives rather than live as Roman slaves. And let me tell you how that went. All the husbands would take their families, and they had all their homes around the outside of Masada. The, the inside were all the, the commerce. And all the homes were in the wall around the outside. They'd bring their individual families in. They would kill the wives first so they wouldn't have to see the children die. And then they would kill their children and then kill themselves. At the very last, there were 12, I think it was 12 men, officers left. They all met in a central complex. They broke a pot. They wrote their names on the broken pieces of the pot and put them into another pot and drew out a name. And that person had to kill all the other officers and then himself. According to the, uh, my guide, he said it's because they didn't want to lose their identity. They knew that if Rome came in, their wives would be raped, the men would be made slaves, and the, the children would be raised as Roman citizens. And instead of losing their identity as Jewish people, believers of the one true God, they decided that they would kill themselves first. Josephus, Josephus wrote this account in his Wars of the Jews. They had died in the belief that they had left not a soul of them alive to fall into Roman hands. The Romans advanced to the assault, seeing none of the enemy but on all sides the awful solitude, 
in flames within, in silence, they were at a loss to conjecture what had happened here, encountering the massive slain. Instead of exulting over their enemies, they admired the nobility of their resolve. So you may believe, but sometimes that's just a, an exercise in using your mind and the things that you want to get a hold of. Maybe you think you believe, but let me ask you this. What would happen if someone asked you to deny Christ or die? Because that's what we're confronted with when we hear stories of Masada and people that are willing to do anything instead of give up on the faith that they have. What would happen if someone asked you to deny Christ or die? Paul writes to Timothy, his son in the faith, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So my question to you is this. Will you finish well? Will the faith that you have bring you to a place where you will make a difference in another's life? That you will stand for who you are as a Christian instead of losing your identity in a cultural war that seeks to make you a slave to the world? So let me ask you some questions before we pray this morning. I think everybody in this place here would say that you have a certain element of faith. But maybe you're saying, I don't know if I'd have the faith to take a stand like those people in Masada. Husbands, fathers, would you be able to take that first step? If forced to, if required to? Serious stuff. And you know what? We have people all around the world right now being martyred for their faith, for taking a stand for Christ. In so many ways, we have it so easy here. So if you have an element of faith, and then this morning you would say, I want more faith. <laughs> I don't know if I could stand and do something like that, but I would like to be able to grow my faith, right? Jesus said, if you have faith, I'm a mustard seed, <laughs> right? And sometimes, and, and the, man, the man that said to Jesus, right, I believe, help my unbelief, <laughs> right? We have an element of faith, and sometimes we just want to grow that and see that blossom and, and renew and become stronger. So if that's you this morning, would you raise your hand? Anybody want more faith this morning? Amen. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, Lord, for those that want more faith. God, I know that you can grow their faith. And God, I pray that this mustard seed of faith that they might have right now would blossom, God. It becomes the biggest of trees, Jesus said. And so even the smallest amount of faith can grow. And God, sometimes we need situations in our lives to help us build our faith and they're not always good situations but god we can see your hand at work even through the dark times and so god in this moment i pray for those that want more faith that you would continue to grow that in jesus name in jesus name so my other question is this is there anyone in here that is yet to take a step of faith that has ever said, you know what, I've heard about Jesus, I, but I've never taken a step of faith to believe, to actually say, you know what, in this moment, I want to start that journey. Is there anyone in here that wants to do that today? Amen. We're going to pray together, all right? Everybody pray so that nobody's left out. Because when, when we, this is something that happens as a body, right? When somebody says, you know what, I want to take that step of faith. I want to begin this today. You know, that, that's an awesome time to rejoice. But it also can be awkward for the person saying, I want to do that. So we're going to pray together, all right? So let's just pray together. Heavenly Father. Come on, everybody together. Heavenly Father. I thank you that you love me first that you forgive my sins, and that you've called me your own. I believe that you lived. I believe that you died. I believe that you were raised again so that I could have eternal life.
Thank you for new life. Today I give you mine. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we rejoice. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to pray a blessing over you. The faithful, those that are called to do great and mighty things in Jesus' name, stepping out in faith. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> well, may you be filled with all of God's fullness, and may you have the mind and the heart of Christ. May you be consistent in your commitment when you feel in touch and when you feel out of touch. Walk by faith and not by feeling. Resting on his promise. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Praise God and let God's peace dwell with you today and always. Amen. Amen.